Welcome everybody to this morning's panel uh, entitled Seeing Ourselves on Screen. My name is Jan Fran. I will be your moderator for the panel today. Uh, and just a reminder, we come to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay respects to elders past and present. I extend a very warm welcome to any First Nations people here today as well. Um, this is a panel, like I said, it does, it, well, I aim for it to do what it says on the box, seeing ourselves on screen. What does that mean for diverse and for minority communities? You're going to, I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but you're going to see me do a lot of this, because sometimes I feel like the words that we use to describe, you know, minorities, diverse, cowled people are wholly insufficient, but unfortunately, I don't have better terms right now, so if you see me doing that, that's where that comes from. Um, I think on this panel, hopefully, I, I, I'm really wanting to ask, who gets to tell Australian stories? What are Australian stories? What is the Australian face? And how do we get, how do we accurately reflect Australia? How do we turn on a screen and see ourselves reflected back at us? Uh, um, We've got a wonderful panel here today. You can see them here, including Elaine, who's coming to us um, via Zoom. G'day, mate. Um, a lot of really strong personal stories that I want to uh, dig into ASAP, and I can see that clock is counting down and striking <coughs> terror into my heart. So <laughs> let's get rolling. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Kortha. Kortha is an Australian producer. She's a director. Um, she's of East African and South Asian heritage. <laughs> I'm not sure I get that right. Uh, she won the BMW short film competition at the 2018 Indian Film Festival of Melbourne, and she went on to create the TikTok series Matched. Um, she's also the director, producer, writer of the YouTube uh, comedy series Salma Season as well, and is the founder of her own independent production company. Next to Katha, we have um, Pallavi Sharda. Pallavi is, well, she's the first actress of Indian heritage to play leading roles in Australian screen productions. Um, she's an actor, she's a classical uh, dancer, and she's worked extensively in the US, in Britain, in Australian cinema, but also in India, where she became the first Australian Bollywood leading lady. It's quite yeah. a feat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, next to Pallavi, we've got Julie Peters. Julie joined the ABC in 1971. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Where the starting salary was $2,000 a year. Yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> yeah, a couple of people are like, what? We need to adjust for inflation. <laughs> um, she was actually the, the audio assistant on the first episode of Countdown, which I think aired in 1975. <laughs> Um, Julie was assigned male at birth and everyone expected her to behave like a boy, but since childhood, she knew she'd be much happier in life and in work um, and in relationships if the world saw her for who she truly is. Uh, and finally, to my right, over here coming to us on Zoom, we have Elaine Crombie, who is a singer, a songwriter, an actor, a comedian. Uh, she's performed on stage productions both nationally and internationally. She's a Pitjan Jajara. I uh, hope I did say that right. I did practice. Uh, Warring Mall and South Sea Island woman. Um, her career has spanned two decades. I'm certain you've seen her either come through your television screen, your movie screens, or on a theatre production um, at some point. I can rattle off the list of theatre companies she'd worked for, but we'd be here all day, Elaine. So please put your hands together for our wonderful panellists. OK, seeing ourselves on screen. Um, Pallavi, let me start with you. So you uh, s sort of not really started your career here in Australia, but you, you were studying. Yeah. You were, you know, looking at what the industry looked like here. Mm -hmm. You made the decision to go over to India um, where you spent considerable time and you've since come back from India. Can you talk us through just what that process was like for you from starting to leaving to coming back? Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I grew up in Melbourne. I was born in Perth. I grew up in Melbourne. And as a young child, I articulated that when I grow up, I want to be a Bollywood actress. Uh, because my, my screen inspirations, given you know, the nature of the exhibition, it's relevant to, to say, were the Indian female goddesses of Bollywood. And I think 
I saw myself reflected somewhat, even though they were these fantastical women dancing around trees. I thought, that's me. Um, and I want to do that. But that was a childhood fantasy, you know, and you, you, you grow up and you think, I'm going to go and get a proper job and all of those things. But while I was studying at Melbourne Uni, I realised, no, I actually do really want to be a performing artist. I was a classical Indian dancer. I learnt Bharatanatyam, which is a classical Indian dance film in the suburbs of Melbourne. And was relegated in a sense to community spaces as a dancer and a performing artist through my teenage years. Come to a Diwali function and do a dance for us or um, can you just come and do the light bulb and do a little workshop and patting the dog for us. And I realised that that was not going to fulfil me as an artist. I deserved more and I aspired to more. So I started uh, to do acting cl classes here in Melbourne. I also was studying broadcast journalism and really thought of broadcast as a, as a potential career path for me as a communicator. But in both of those cases was told point blank that there was no space for me on Australian screens because A, I could never dye my hair blonde, uh, so broadcast was out and I had skin which would mean that I'd never see myself on an Australian screen. And, and when I'll you say point blank, people said this teachers, to you? Teachers, teachers, yes. An, an acting teacher and a broadcast journalism teacher. And they were not saying it with malice, they were just saying it to, to you know, point out the lay of the land. And at the time, I remember not even being disappointed. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense, I guess. So uh, I'll just go to Bollywood then, like I said I would when I was four years old. And that's what I did. And unfortunately, the experience there, fortunately or unfortunately, the experience there was incredibly taxing. It's a very, very difficult industry to penetrate. And I often wonder if I had felt that there was space for me in my home country, would I have had to go through what I did as a young woman in Mumbai? And possibly not. And, I, and you know, mm. the disempowerment on both ends of the spectrum was just so huge. You know, there was the racism in Australia and the misogyny in India, and I was battling these two isms. And um, ultimately, when I read an article, I think, on diversity, diversity, on Australian yeah, see, screens. See, this pops up quite a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Because we were discussing before we got yeah. here th this morning that we don't see ourselves as diverse, or I certainly don't. I'm just a human. I don't walk around going, oh, I'm diverse. It's so fun. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but, but that language was essential to actually articulate that there was a paucity of opportunity for p people of colour in my case. So I went, well, I was born, uh, born on on the land that is now Australia and I deserve to to work there mm. and I deserve to at least try to represent a community that has such a huge impact on who we are as Australians and so I, uh, I came back. Yeah well you well, I mean when when you left you were obviously a lot um, younger and a lot less experienced than mm -hmm. what you were when you then came back to Australia mm. and started working in the industry here. How was coming back for you and did you notice any differences between the industry when you left V when you came back? Well you know in Indian cinema hadn't won any Oscars for for great music yet. Well I mean J-Ho I guess wasn't a wasn't an Indian film but Natu Natu hadn't happened yet so um when I came back and I was a Bollywood actress, I realised that that was so irrelevant in the eyes of the industry here, except for being this exoticised thing that I mm -hmm. had as a label. Even though it's one of the biggest industries in the world, the, the situations that I'd worked in, the kind of sets I'd worked on, the roles that I'd played were so rigorous, that was unseen. And all of a sudden I started from scratch um, all over again. You know, I came, went back to minimum wage, I went back to, you know, being the person who, you know, on sets in Australia and sets everywhere, it's quite hierarchical, but I was very much at the bottom of the rung, at bottom of the ladder. And that was that was hard to kind of stomach for a, still a very young woman mm. who was coming back and going, oh, it's irrelevant to you that I had a viewing audience of hundreds of millions of people for, in some of my films because that audience is brown. That mm. audience is irrelevant to a white... You know, if, if I had have gone to Hollywood... If I, have, you know, I didn't even have the choice. I didn't even get to go and be on Home and Away or Neighbours and then say, oh, now I'm going to go to LA. That wasn't a pathway that was open to me. Right. Mm. So if that was the case and had happened for me, maybe I'd come back and people would say, oh, wow, our girl's overseas doing really well and working at a high level. Um, you know, let's integrate her into our industry in a way that is, is she may deserve. But, yeah, so it was mm. a difficult transition back. Mm. Um, Katha, let me go to you. Let's get, can you talk us a little bit about your sort of pathway and how you've ended up where 
you are now. How much time do we have again? Uh, <laughs> not very much time, according to that clock. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, my pathway, um, it's interesting because when I first, uh, I, I guess similar to Pallavi, like my reference to cinema was always Bollywood. So I grew up in Kenya and Bollywood is huge in Africa because culturally the themes that are explored and how stories are portrayed cu would culturally um, be relevant to us. And so um, Shah Rukh Khan is huge. People speak Hindi um, because of Bollywood and that's how I understand Hindi, thanks to Bollywood. Mm. And so um, for me, I was always fascinated by this world that was, you know, uh, that I was kind of exposed to. Um, and I, and I kind of wondered, you know, what's the space for me? And I didn't really see myself as an actress because I just didn't fit that mold. <laughs> um, but there was something about that space that just always intrigued me. Um, I moved to Australia in 2006 uh, and I was in high school at that time. Um, and then I was exposed to how the mainstream media in Australia was portraying Muslims. And it was always in a, in a very negative light and till this day it's still the same, unfortunately. Um, but at that time, it was shocking to me because I would see some something about a Muslim person in the news and I, my, my reaction would always be like, wait, that's not true. Mm. Wait, hold on, what's going on? And I just said to myself, you know, something needs to be done about this. I don't know what needs to change, but something needs to change. And how the media would paint me was actually impacting me in my real life and how I was being treated at school and out in the real world. In, in what ways? I mean, it's, it's crazy because now that I reflect on certain things that happened to me, I, I see that these were racist incidents, um, mm. racist racially um, influenced attacks towards me and my identity. Um, but back then it was kind of masked under, oh, we're just having fun, we're just playing with you, it's a joke. Mm. I remember I was in year 10, and I haven't publicly ever shared this with anyone before. Um, I was in year 10, it was uh, recess, and it was, it was the month of Ramadan, I was fasting. And that was the first time that I told my classmates and my friends that I'm a Muslim. And at that time I wasn't wearing the headscarf, so they didn't, there wasn't anything visibly identifying me as a Muslim. So... Um, the girls thought it was funny and they threw a piece of bacon at me. Um, and if you mm. understand Muslim culture, like <laughs> bacon is something, like it's haram, so we don't consume pork mm. um, or bacon. And, um, a, and at that time, I actually laughed it off. I was like, oh, like it's funny. Right. But now that I think about it, like I realize how they were also influenced by the media right. because they were being fed this narrative that these guys are not us. They're a threat to our society they're different and they don't belong in Australia. Mm. And so all of these things um, shaped my identity and I went through a phase where I had to search myself really because I, I was struggling between figuring out, am I Australian? Because I thought I was Australian. We got our citizenship in two years. It was much easier back then. <laughs> um, and I thought I called myself Australian but then I wasn't I didn't feel it, you know? Mm. I didn't feel Australian. I wasn't made to feel like I was part of the society. I was just given a piece of paper that said I'm Australian. Mm. And, and so I was like, okay, what am I? What is my identity? And so I had to go through this whole journey of like self-discovery. And I decided to pursue my bachelor's degree in Islamic studies because I was like, I need to know myself and I need to understand my heritage, my history, my culture on a more deeper level so I can actually communicate and talk to people about it because whenever I'm out and I'm talking to people, there's always questions about who I am and my cultural practices. And, you know, when you're growing up in that culture, you don't academically respond to why you do things. Yeah, but then you just do you things. You just do things because yeah. it's mm -hmm. part of your life. And so I felt like if I'm going to be talking about my culture and my traditions, then I want to be able to articulate it in a in a manner that's, that comes from a place of confidence right. rather than just saying, oh, we do this because we do it. Yeah. And so um, 
I kind of put my dream, my filmmaking dreams aside and I pursued Islamic studies. And after that, I did a short program in documentary filmmaking because I, I wanted to go into that space initially. What was it about that space in particular? Because when you say, you know, you saw the representations of Muslims in Australia and you thought something needs to change, something different needs to happen. What was it about going into that space what propelled you to go into that space and did you think you could make a difference there? Because I felt like I didn't really see anyone who was telling our stories authentically and was mm. really... Um, I, didn't, I didn't see anyone who genuinely cared about the community because for, for other people who were reporting on Muslim stories or telling Muslim stories, there were outsiders peeking in, oh, this is interesting, like, tell me more about this rather than... You know, I've lived through this experience. I know what my community, the traumas that we've been through, or you know, the stories that we actually want to celebrate and tell, it wasn't coming from an authentic place. And I felt like that's lacking. Mm. And so I guess that propelled me into being someone who actually does something about the problem that I was seeing yeah. out in the industry. Yeah. Let me, let me go to you, Elaine. You grew up in a, um, a small town in South Australia, Port Pirie, I think, I think it is, which, um, you know, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have a very big film and theatre and television and stage industry. How did you end up where you are? What was your pathway? And did you always know that this was the path that you were going to take growing up? First of all, way, Ngayulu Elaine, Ngayulu Yonkanjara Wadagame, South Sea Island, German. Um, growing up in period, well, you know, shout out to Lillian Crombie. I'm here because of her and shout out to um, Lorna Turner for putting mum through ballet classes. <laughs> She's a trained, trained ballerina, my mother. And, you know, shout out to my ancestors because without them I wouldn't be here. Um, yeah, growing up in Port Piri was, oh, you know, you get called a bong and a nigger and far out. I haven't, I just used those words. I haven't heard them for years, years and years, you know. But that was probably my reality, being the only black kid in the class. And, um, you know, every time we kind of talked about, uh, every time we had our history lesson, lessons of, Australia and they talked about the Aborigines, everyone would kind of look to me and be like, oh, that's, that's your people. Um, but, yeah, it was, no, there wasn't a, um, there's not a big arts thing over there, you know, but. I mean, your mum's you know, a very mom, big mom influence on like, Yes. Yeah, through the industry, you know, and so when when I was getting in trouble at school, the Aboriginal education worker and mum and nan had a meeting and said, I oh, will send her down to Adelaide to um, to the Centre for Aboriginal Studies and Music. And, you know, I was 16 and I went down there for that in Adelaide Uni and then still wasn't, still kept veering off the path and ended up, you know, then another meeting occurred and I ended up going to uh, Brisbane to be in, to start um, with um, the Aboriginal Centre for Performing Arts. I've been one of the um, mm. alumni from that, the school that was then run by Michael Leslie and has produced a lot of my year and previous years that that are still in the industry working today. Yeah, so it was just, it was that kind of, it's, it's, it is it is heavily based on mum and her connections and who she knew to get me to where I am today. And now I'm just like, I mean, I'm still hustling and thriving, but it's a slog. Yeah. Elaine, we're going to come back to you because I think we're having just some slight, uh, a slight delay there on on your feed um, and some moments of freezing. So I'm, I might just um, shoot Julie a question and and come back to you if that's okay. Um, 
I mean, the, ho- the whole sort of topic and, and panel discussion is about visibility and visibility for certain people, certain communities, certain cultures. Uh, you had to struggle for visibility, not just on the screen, but in your own life and in your own workplace. Um, talk us through a, a little bit about how that was for you and, you know, when you made the decision to be visible as yourself. I transitioned in 1990, which was a fairly stressful period. Prior to that, I just didn't think I would be able to cope with it because of the extreme pressures. Um, Basically, uh, so many people seem to believe that gender is defined by biology and and, um, whereas I never thought that because, you know, even when I was like a child and um, I asked my mum why she thought I was a boy and she said, well, because God made you a boy. And I went, oh, that odd why is this god person trying to do this to me and <laughs> and then um and then a few years later um peter maloney one of the kids next you know, next door he told me that um uh, girls didn't have penises and i'm like oh, that's crazy because i'm the eldest of nine and and my, my first six siblings are boys so i didn't actually, didn't actually know that so i was about it was about i was about 10 before i realized girls didn't have penises and <laughs> but but then I, but i still wasn't convinced i just said well what's that got to do with be, you know, being a girl or a boy, it just seems a really dumb idea. Um, and uh, but then, you know, as I got into my teens, I was, I had started to, re- to take on the, internalise the transphobia of the society I was in, and became very, very secretive. And you know, I had odd pressures, like my, um, you know, my father was really determined that I'd be a priest. Um, and how'd that go? <laughs> Well, I, I can still recite chunks of the Mass in Latin, <laughs> um, which I, I won't, I won't uh, fo- foist on you at the moment. But uh, I, I didn't become a priest, as it turns out, because by, by the time I finished high school, I was Catholic-trained atheist. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and Catholic-trained atheist, you know, Catholicism is a really good way to learn to be an atheist, <laughs> is my opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, anyway, but <laughs> I, I started... And I made the a big mistake I made in 196. I started uni in 1969. I, I I started in the Faculty of Engineering at Melbourne University, and uh, the culture was just so misogynist. I just couldn't cope. Mm. Even, even though I managed to scrape through first year, eventually did end up with a science degree. But I, I just could couldn't cope with the culture. Um, and very quickly, I was a uni dropout, and that's how I ended up at the ABC in mm. 1971. <laughs> As a uni dropout. That's how most people end up at the ABC. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, um, you know, like when I transitioned in 1990, you know, it was still, by that stage, I was a technical producer and lighting director. And, um, and, and you know, uh, I just remember in the canteen, just around about that, so this is 1990, so you've got to Im- imagine that, you know, I'm 33 years cuter than I am now, <laughs> um, that um, one of the guys just looked me up and down and said, you ought to have transsexual tattooed on your forehead so blokes like me aren't tricked into being foofters. Oh, wow. And as you can see, I didn't get the tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take his advice. And, uh, and and gradually over a period of time, I realised... And ran, yeah, I, the first public speaking I did on trans and gender diversity was 1981, where I, I was invited to speak to third year medical students at Monash, and um, and gradually that um, started to realise that I that you know there was a huge mythology about what who trans people were mm. out there, and and I would say that the reason I've moved from behind the camera to in front of the camera was to you know to de- try and demythologize trans and you know um and one of the st- steps on the way was for example um um you know well, actually and my, my it turns out my phd supervisor was in the room <laughs> maria um and and she kept inviting me to um, um speak to her students and and in a way i was that was my test audience uni, uni students trying to work out what what issues they found important so you know, um, and, and I'm, I'm trying many different ways. Like in September, I'm at the Butterfly Club, in a way, doing stand-up sociology. I guess it's sort of hard. My new, my new, my new genre. That's a very interesting Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, to me, the big aim is to demythologize what trans is. But along the way, I learned a lot about what gender is. So because, in a way, the exception proves the rule. What I've learned a lot by by um, talking about trans is I learned a lot about gender and how gender works in the social yeah. world. 
Yeah. It's interesting hearing you say that term demythologize because I feel like that can be applied sort of across the board um, and it taps into what, you know, all of our panelists really have kind of brought up is that there's already these very ingrained ideas about what a trans person is, about what an, you know, an, an Indian or a brown person is, about what a Muslim is, about what um, Indigenous or Aboriginal mm. people are. Um, where, and this is a question for our entire panel, whoever wants to take it, where do these mythologies come from? Why are they there? And how do you, when you say you want to demythologize, how do you do that? Well, the way I've tried is just to keep telling stories. Like when there's negative press about trans, I, go, I try and go somewhere else and do a positive story, you know, like, um, and sometimes it, it, it has a long turnaround. Like um, last, last year, I'd, I was featured in an episode of Compass on, you know, which is ABC Religion and Ethics. And part of me goes, well, that's really interesting that ABC Religion and Ethics is doing a story about trans. Um, but, but the woman who was the producer, um, Tracy, Tracy Spring, she remembers me transitioning in 1990. She was in, working in staging at that time. So, and sometimes it's just, there's sometimes a really long, um, uh, I can't think of what the word is, um, process in, in, for somebody to come to the realisation that, that there is a story here. And mm. when she pitched the story to me, I just thought that, is that really a story? Anyway, but she pitched the story as an accidental archivist because as I was growing up, I didn't. I didn't know anything about trans either. I, I was living in a transphobic society, so why wouldn't I be transphobic? And, and I think, in a way, that is one of the thing. One of the things, um, particularly in LGBT communities, we grow up in homophobic and transphobic societies, so we internalise that. Back in the nineties, I was just doing switchboard for gay yeah. lesbian switchboard, and I would say about eighty percent of the calls I got were, you, you could actually put down to internalised homophobia. Right. It's funny hearing you say, like, you didn't know anything about trans and you are a trans person. So, you know, your understanding of yourself came from outside of yourself in a lot of ways and, and the way that you were sort of represented. I, I, just very quickly, all the movies I saw up until about 1990, right. the trans person was a murderer, suicide, it always murdered. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Pallavi, this question is for you, but also um, mm. for... Um, Elaine and, and Katha as well. You talk a lot about the gays. Mm -hmm. um, that's G-A-Z-E, by, by the way. <laughs> Let me just preface that. Um, <laughs> it's a couple of people like, I'm sorry, what? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you talk about the, 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 the gays, right? And yeah. I'll, I'll get you to sort of explain what you mean when, when you talk about that but you, but, and why you feel like you need to subvert that. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, in in line with what everyone said here, the way that we are portrayed as people of colour, women of colour, me as a South Asian woman, for example, I've often been the exoticised other mm. because in relation to the mythology of Australiana, that's the role that I've been asked to play. And so the gaze operates or has operated thus far to uh, cement that role and to cement that place. And I think it is from switching it around and saying, look, this is how... I look at the world or this is how we can look at a person of South Asian heritage with, you know, their environment and their context, um, keeping in mind their environment and context, that is the only way to actually create intercultural empathy and understanding because if you're going to other me, then I have no hope in hell of actually entering the conversation which happens in the nucleus of culture making mm. um, behind the scenes. And I, I see So you it. feel like an outsider? Yeah, I mean, I, I always I talk about this quite often. You know, I've, I was relegated to the periphery in the cultural spaces in Australia, or I was made to believe that I would always be relegated to the periphery. Ironically, when I went to India, when I penetrated the nucleus of quote unquote Bollywood, um, I, 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 that was when I really realised, you know, the inside outside role and the subject object role that I had to play and that I had to choose. Because, you know, your subjectivity is stripped. You're, you become the object and you are and you are something you have to play a role within the narrative of, of somebody else or, mm. you know, other higher culture makers. And that delicate Hessian of, of Australiana wants you to be in one corner. And, it, you know, I've seen it in shows that I've done when I've started stopped working in Bollywood and, you know, I did a role in Tom and Jerry, for example, which is a very mainstream Hollywood film and you get to set and I went... 
oh, so this is a Hindu wedding, yeah? And they're like, yeah. And then I was like, so I'm going to come on an elephant. Yep, yep. Um, intercultural, yep, yep. Why am I in a white dress? Well, because it's an intercultural wedding, you know. It's, it's a mixed wedding. And I went, well, you know, the, white is the colour of funerals in Hinduism. An <laughs> Indian woman would be wearing colour. And it was that thing of really having to subvert every ounce of how they wanted me to be perceived or right. wanted, or the role that I was meant to play within the optics of diversity that were going on. Um, please don't publish that I said that about Tom, Tom and Jerry anyway. I love, <laughs> I love my producers. Um, no, but that's the thing. And the fear, the fear that is instilled when you critique, you know, the world that you, that you work in because there is this sense that one should be so grateful to have been given an opportunity at all. Mm. One should be so grateful that we're even telling your stories now or that we're even acknowledging you exist. So I, I think that that is all that can only change and that fear can only be extracted from our bodies and our beings when we don't feel like the gaze is one of being the object and we're allowed to have subjectivity of our own. Mm. And does that mean in part owning your own narrative and actually being the one that is able to Absolutely. You know, and with make that, things, say things, yes. create things. And with that comes so much trauma that, you know, is again inbuilt in our bodies because when you when I walked into rooms, even when I was a young law clerk, I remember being told at a law firm that I carried myself with too much confidence. And mm. I, by by an HR director. And therefore, you know, just just, okay. you know, calm it on the confidence. And I was like, I w I don't realise I was the only Asian woman in the in the, on the floor right. and I was the only young Asian law clerk on the floor and I went, oh, that's right because I'm expected to be obedient, head down and a hard worker. If for me to walk in and, and have a voice as well, to be heard as well as seen, oh, that's way too much for this environment. Mm. Mm. So, so, uh, so in terms of owning the narrative and having that ability to have an authentic voice, it's about overcoming so many of these societal barriers and also psychological barriers that have been created in an entire group of people, many groups of people that have been othered and marginalised. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that conversation is so difficult, it's so delicate and it's so uncomfortable. And that's, I think, one of the main barriers to entry when it comes to actually harnessing that authentic voice because how do I even now, even though I've, you know, for, have a successful career and this and that and the other, I still think I don't even know how to go about doing this because there's been no pathway and no precedent and no one wants to have an uncomfortable conversation with why those barriers existed and how I need help and mentorship to overcome them, yeah. even at my level in my career. So I cannot imagine what it has been or still continues to be for those that feel marginalised today. Yeah. Hey, Elaine, I want to um, come to you. And, and just before I do that, I just want to let all of you in the audience know that um, we'll be opening the floor to questions in about 10 minutes. So if you have any questions suing about your brain, you'll get a chance to ask them, but maybe use the next 10 minutes to work up a question for um, any of our panellists. Uh, Elaine, I've also I've, I've heard you talk in the past about the importance um, of authentic storytelling and of being able to tell your story your way. Um, why why has that been a central theme to the work that you do? Why is that so important for you to be able to do? And do you feel like you're able to do it in Australia in the way that you want? Well, it's just nothing about us without us, you know. Don't mm -hmm. think – I mean, and I'm going to – like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to – I'm trying to um, uh, uh, edit myself while I talk. I shouldn't do that. No, nah, don't do it. Know, it. Just say it. it just moral frenzy. It's like, yeah, like you just got to, You. it's just about taking space. Like I, every day I'm, you know, it's always about land rights. Me every day, yeah, stolen land, move. I'm not paying for this stolen land. No, I wouldn't do that. I don't steal. But. It's like, um, you know, you've got to, like, I, I feel a huge responsibility for my, for my kids, my community, all of the, all of the young ones and my peers who look up to me um, in order to just keep staying steady on that track of taking space in, in the arts, in theatres, on set. Um, in, you know, writers' rooms, 
all of that kind of stuff and just having that having those strong listening ears on to make sure that people are moving in the right way when they're representing when they're wanting to represent us wanting to produce our films have you got all of the people that need to be in the room mm. you know and what more what do you think do you think that they do have all the people that need to be in the room do you think that there are things that yeah, what, like what works what better. doesn't it's definitely it's definitely getting better but you know it's like keep on that steady like don't take your foot off the pedal if you're telling stories on land then make sure you've got all of your cultural consultants in the room and make sure that the story weaves in the right direction like i just finished working on um limbo up in uh up in kubapiti and like kubapiti is my where my like i'm related to practically the whole town <laughs> and i was working as a um as a, a producer a associate producer on there and i quickly realized that if 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 Ivan, oh, so as Ivan sends film, if Ivan had written something, or if he wanted to portray something, then I would have to go and talk to at least five different people. And you know, it was even this one day where I had to bring like four people to set, and I rang my cousin, and he had to come, and they had to have a conversation about what this young girl would be saying mm. to to the lead. You know, like it's that kind of like it's 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 processed, but you've got to do it. And we have to practice doing it and, and get better at doing it so that it doesn't, I mean, this is going to sound poxy to say, but so that it doesn't slow down the process of mm. filming, but at the same time, you've still got to do that. Like these are, these are immovable things. If we want to present ourselves in the right way and do the right thing and not, and not, um, you know, piss off our elders, because that's that's ultimately what it is. It's it's about our elders and our stories, and portraying them in the right way. If we don't do that in the right way, then it's then we're the ones that have to wear it, and nobody else. You know, like if that wasn't done in the right way, then I'd be getting in trouble. Yeah, you know? I'd yeah. be getting talked to. Yeah, it's funny that you say. You know, you the the, the processes need to be. Um, it's an immovable feat right, and that the processes need to be ironed yeah. out um, so that, and again, I, I saw that a little bit of hesitancy, like you want the production to run on time. Like no one wants to cause trouble here, right? And I know that this was something that... Oh, like... no, I want to cause trouble. <laughs> <laughs> not... I... yeah, yeah. Because because if if you're not listening, then we need to have another conversation and yeah. do it again. Like I'll, I'm, and because and I've been here for so long and... Uh, for so long I've been here for a millennia no but because of because I've been in the industry and I watch how it works and I see things move and I've been in different scenarios and stuff like that like now I just go oh well we're just going to take space mm -hmm. like I will cause a problem until we rectify what the problem is yeah, yeah. do you feel that you've you been know? able to do that because you are now quite experienced within the industry that you work in and because you have those yeah. connections and you have you know i guess a stronger voice perhaps yeah yeah definitely that's and you know i've worked i've worked a couple of years with the with the union um and so just understanding those kind of processes and of and like working for for 25 years um, in in the industry, and also like like I see I see us losing our elders that were in this space saying these words. Hey, this on me, right? But Luke Carroll and I Luke Carroll and I had a conversation um, a couple of months back at a at a um, sorry event and. We were both looking at each other, and I said, "I think it's our time. We have to do this now." <laughs> and we were, we were having a giggle about it, but at the same time, we were just looking at each other. I was like, "No, dude, this is real. Like, it's not. Right. We're not. And it is real. Like, because who else? If not us, then yeah. who? Yeah. 
I feel like Kathy like sort it's of our had... responsibility to do that. Yeah, mm. you've also I, I don't know if you kind of relate to what Elaine was saying in that sense exactly. of like I have to do mm-hmm. something because if mm-hmm. I don't do something, who is going to do something? Yeah, and I guess it, it it sort of brings me to you know why I even started my own production company in the first place because I think a lot of times we see producers who you know yes they've got goodwill but. Um, Sometimes I feel like certain stories are being told without honouring the sacredness Mm. of that community or their experiences. And um, if you're not going to accommodate to certain things, like, for example, you know, if if you're going to be telling a story about a Muslim character or, you know, um, or the Muslim experience is centred in your story, then are you telling it with Muslims? Are you taking Muslim culture into consideration when you're bringing Muslims on set? Um, Are you creating a a set that's culturally competent? Are you scheduling times for prayer breaks? Are you accommodating to halal meal options? Are you uh, familiar with, you know, certain customs when it comes to, say, costume styling? And, you know, I've seen a lot of hijabi women on screen and... I roll my eyes and I'm like, who did their scarf? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like how did they put this thing together? Because this is so, sa- everything is so sacred to our experience. And if you're not going to honor us, then don't do it mm. because you're actually making a mockery of us and our experiences mm. by saying that we are representing or we, you know, telling your story. Mm. You're you're really not. It's better that you don't do it and let us do it because, you know, we can do it better. Mm. Mm. Does anyone have any questions? Um, we've probably got about. Oh, here we go. There's one now. We've got some roving mics as well, so I'm going to make sure that I get a mic over to you. Um, I can I can see you right there in in the middle. Hands raised. I see you. Hey, hey, hang on a second. Wait for that mic. We're going to do a bit of a. <laughs> Pass the parcel situation. Anyone else? Can do we have? Uh, we've got a question. You've got a mic already. Okay, right on. You're you're up next. Let's go to that question up there. Hello, excellent, excellent uh, information. Thank you so much. My name is Cecily. I uh, I, I, I do a lot of things. Um, but one of the things that I am really passionate about is um, I also work as an intimacy coordinator and a and a cultural consultant in the arts. And all of you, but particularly Elaine, have talked about the need for cultural consultants. Um, obviously. Obviously, it's very specific here in Australia. We think a lot of it when it comes to Indigenous First Nations and Torres Strait Islander stories. But I do find that quite often um, the rest of our stories, the rest of the brown people, there is not enough knowledge about our specific cultures in order to have a a Muslim intimacy director and a Muslim cultural consultant because oftentimes we are one part of what is diverse, right? Because we've got a Muslim character, we've got a black character, we've got a whatever character. So I guess the question is, for those parts of the stories that are important and need to be specific, how do we find the line between expecting the actor who is portraying that to need to bring all of their identity and all of their culture and all their knowledge into it to speak up for themselves um, versus the the production being responsible for having support um, for that person to have agency or for them to just not have to be the expert and for someone else to inform that. Mm-hmm. Who wants to take that? I'm, I'm going to jump in if Pal- that's all right. Only, only because it's quite relevant to an experience I had very recently in Australia. I did a show last year called The Twelve. I don't know if anyone saw it, but um, my character had a lot of sex on screen. And as an Indian, you know, woman who grew up in a Hindu culture, despite ancient texts which might speak to the contrary um you know it's it's a very it's it's a pretty conservative community and I think I don't know if a South Asian woman has had sex on screen in Australia before and certainly it was the one show that my parents were not are still not allowed to watch because it is so core to the sacredness of how we operate as a community and the mores with which we're expected to grow up And then you go into your workplace and there's a role which was first 
you know, done in, it was a Flemish show, a white woman portrayed that role and you attach artificially an Indian identity to Mm. the role because we need diversity, let's just make her Indian. And I went, whoa, you know, the intersectionality of that is so complex because now I'm a woman playing, portraying someone who has PTSD, who portrays it, who, who, who experiences it through sexual exploits. And yet I'm an Indian woman who grew up in Sydney, what part of Sydney, what was her background, what were her parents' migration story, you know, why, and, and you know, the makers are like, well, her parents are very open about her, her, her promiscuity even when they were alive. Well, really, were they? Because I've never seen any Indian parents that were cool with their kids' <laughs> sexual promiscuity, you know. Um, I don't, I think my parents think I'm Anyway, um, <laughs> which you are, yeah, of I'm course. totally. Uh, <laughs> except for on the 12, <laughs> broke it. Um, no, and it was an extremely challenging experience for me. And I did have to walk in and I did have to carry the, the burden of my community, of, of, of our stories, of our ancestors. I mean, when I went to Bollywood, my grandmother said to me, Beta, which means child, you've chosen this path. Let me say one thing to you. We come from the rishis which are like, you know, the guys that wrote the Bhagavad Gita, they were, you know, very, very conservative Brahmin family. Apne aapko pavitta rakna, which means in Hindi, keep yourself pure, which means don't sleep around for work. And that's what people were asked to do in Bollywood when you had no, when you had no context and no contacts. So sexuality was so linked to the entertainment industry mm. in such a mm. perverse way. And I was fighting all of that at home already before. So it's a whole other layer of the story that we don't have time to go into. But then you come back and play a role like this and you're carrying all of this weight. And to walk into a room and be like, okay, we had a COVID shutdown, so I have to shoot eight scenes in one day Two of them are sex scenes. Um, okay, we only have time for a close-up here, a close-up there. The productions need to be less lazy about this. Right. Productions need to attribute more budget to this. They need to understand that an intimacy coordinator is not necessarily enough unless they're trained in the cultural nuances of the cast involved. That it needs to be more than a cursory conversation the night before or the day before. Mm-hmm. If in a cast member wants a body double, don't wait until two weeks before to find someone. Right. Because if you can't find someone my size or colour, that's on you. That's not my problem. So I, I did all of my scenes in the 12 myself, even though my preference was to have a body double because right. no one was able to find one. And I think they, they put the effort in, but quite frankly, put more. Put more. Yeah. So anyway, mm-hmm. that's my answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> question over here. It's on. Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, um, hello. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm actually, a, I had a question for Pallavi, ma'am. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm from India as well. And uh, it's in relation to Bollywood, actually. So uh, first, like, uh, actually, the one when I was coming to Australia the first time, I actually watched uh, the film Besharam. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you like shooting it or not. But... Um, <laughs> So it's just that I would like to know since like since the OTT, the rise of OTT in the pandemic, uh, female centric stories have risen a lot in Bollywood, like in general, like Rani Mukherjee is headlining a movie or Aishwarya Rai is headlining a movie. So would you consider returning to Bollywood? If you guess, uh, <laughs> It's it's just uh, I'm a fan. I would like to see you on screen. Aww. Yeah, if you would consider returning to Bollywood, like in the, the future, Indian maybe. community asks me this on a daily basis. Who Thank sent you? you? No, no, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Alex. Alex, where in India are you from? I'm from Delhi. You're from Delhi. Yeah. Okay, well, I we, we might be related. I've. Uh, my, my <laughs> uh, thank you for watching Beersham. That's three hours of your life you're never going to get back. Um, <laughs> No, I, I would love to. I would love to. I think for me, and unfor- fortunately or unfortunately, I keep saying this, my artistry has been so linked to the work of what it means to be an artist. And that means that I haven't really had the luxury of saying, I still want to be a Bollywood actor. I had to say, well, what can I do with the platform I've created to further opportunity for people of my community in the country that I was born? Mm. And so it is the, a burden that, you know, burden and an honour to, to have to do this work and to do this work, but it's meant that I haven't always had the flexibility of just saying, I feel like working in this space right now. It is where does space need to be created? So my work in the last four or five years has been for putting the Indian Australian identity on the global map because we exist. Um, and, and, you know, the next role I play, hopefully overseas, I'll be able to have an Australian accent and not be a girl from Jersey. Mm. Um, and that's the priority. But, inshallah, I will go back to India and 
we'll be dancing again soon. So <laughs> yes. that's a very diplomatic way of saying no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I know, but to his point, to Alex's point, Bollywood has evolved in a way which is yeah. so great to see. And it's democratized and the streaming platforms has allowed for what was a pyramid structure and what was a very nepotistic environment to actually democratize. And I think that that means India and Australia have just signed a co-production deal. What I'd like to actually do, Alex, is create projects between India and Australia yeah. and and do that storytelling more effectively. Yeah. Um, look, we are out of time, but but I would like to just um, open up the floor to one more question um, to any of our other panellists. We've got one over here, Mike already in hand, so go ahead. Is this on? It okay, is on. Yes, cool. um, hi, my name is Kasuni. Sorry, I had to write this down because I'm so nervous. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm a Sri Lankan Australian um, training actor and model as well and a huge admirer of all your work and journeys. And I found each story is truly so moving. And I resonated a lot with Pallavi Shadda. I'm sorry, I know there's like been a lot of questions for you. <laughs> um, but I also grew up, grew up um, idolising Bollywood actors and constantly feeling that that dream was so far-fetched, not only because I'm not Indian, <laughs> but also because it was just such a, it was just such a idea that gets popped into your head because they're the people that you see on screen and not on Australian TV. So then naturally you sort of navigate towards it. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, how did you actually change your mindset and overcome that fear of not belonging in either industry and possibly even battling with the mental health struggles that even come with that and not actually feeling like you belong in either industry um, and experiencing mis misogynistic behaviour like you mentioned and the racism and what are the steps that you took to really make your career happen for you both in US and when you came back to the Australian industry? Thank you. Thank Did you, you want to um, go ahead? Okay. Uh, well, I, I dealt with the mental health struggles by writing a memoir. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, no, it, honestly, I did. I wrote. I haven't published it yet, but I needed to process the feelings of unbelonging because that's ultimately what we're all talking about mm -hmm. here is, is do we belong and how do we allow ourselves to be immersed in that feeling and feel safe in the world? Um, and look, it, it's such a big question, but I, I, for me it's just been – so core to, to what I believe in that I ought to ex be able to exist in the country of my birth, in the country that my parents were born in, and that we're not separate. You know, ultimately we're not separate. India, Australia, what Australia was before colonization, I mean, these are all very linked entities. And these are all, we just have these very, very artificial divisions that have that have come about societally through history. And it just takes turning our mind to, to, to break those barriers down. So I think, you know, spiritually, if we do it as individuals, which my journey is very spiritual because I, there's no other way I can actually navigate what I nav have navigated and continue to do so. So I rely a lot on that aspect in my artistry. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, we can have a chat afterwards as if, if we want to go into more detail. <laughs> that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, well, folks, I think that does bring us to the end of our session. I just want to say one thing that I've really taken away, something that Elaine said, but you've just said it right now, Pallavi, it's like this idea of it's my right to exist where I want to exist, mm -hmm. where I feel like I do exist. I have that right. And Elaine, you're talking about taking space, not not actually um, asking for it, it not being given, but you, uh, you taking it <laughs> <laughs> for yourself. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm very glad that you didn't take the advice of whoever it was that told you to be less confident because I think that um, what is needed here is some degree of audacity mm -hmm. to actually be able to, you know, forge a path forward. And when you say there is no path, that's probably because you're all making it right now. So thank yeah, you very much stolen for that. land, Jan. we got to always remember that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I hear what you're saying. Um, and on that note, I think please give it up for Elaine, Kalsa, Pallavi and Julie. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience and see you soon. <laughs>